Welcome to From the Quarries. Well, the votes are in, and the winner by quite a narrow margin to decide what this week's video is going to be is The Geometry of the Royal Arch. This is another chapter from the book The Antiquity of the Royal Arch by F. de P. Castells, published in 1927. Thank you to everyone who took the time to respond to the poll, and I hope you enjoy the video. And again, for reasons of clarity and brevity, I have redacted some portions of the text. Good evening, and welcome to tonight's presentation, From the Quarries, an archive of Masonic Law. The Geometry of the Royal Arch The Royal Arch has to do with mathematical symbols. The square, the right angle, the triangle, the circle, and the cube. In one place, we mention the five regular platonic bodies, which are the tetrahedron, or pyramid, the hexahedron, or cube, the octahedron, the dodecahedron, and the icosahedron. These names sound outlandish, but they only mean geometrical figures of 4, 6, 8, 12, and 20 plane sides. They are said to represent the four elements and the sphere of the universe. In the chapter 2, we emphasize the symbolic importance of that strongest of all architectural forms, the catenarian arch, and of the double cube which is a very important symbol. It is by the discovery of the double cube and all that goes with it that we qualify for the high rank of companions. The Kabbalists used to say that there, at the altar of incense, Michael the Archangel sacrificed the souls of the just, that they may ascend pure and fragrant to Jehovah, thereby acquiring the highest spiritual vision as a reward to their life's endeavours. As companions, however, we deal with advanced geometry, moralising on its figures. Nor should we think that this is only a modern practice. For Dr. Dassigny, writing in 1744, said that in his time, the Royal Arch demanded from its candidates undeniable proofs of their skills in architecture. When we say that the form of a chapter, when properly arranged, approaches as nearly as circumstances will permit to a true catenarian arch, the word chapter has to be taken as consisting of the companions themselves, not the place where they meet. For they themselves are the chapter, and they have to arrange themselves in the position which we know is peculiar to them. And this statement is justified by the action of our principles, when, in the course of ceremonies, they form that catenarian arch in the east. We are informed that the triune essence of the deity is illustrated by the triple tor, and this triple tor is also treated as a geometrical figure. The tor is referred to in Ezekiel Chapter 9, verse 4, in terms to show that in former times it was a sign of acquittal, for in that book we find this charge. Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a tor upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and cry. Slay utterly, but come not near any man upon whom is the tor. Of course, our ancient brethren must have read their Bibles in Hebrew to see this. It is true that the Tor is derived from the Hebrew, being the name of the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet. But this can only be a statement of the latter-day companions. And 200 years ago, or for that matter 60 years ago, the only meaning to be put on this statement was that the word or name of the letter was Hebrew. It could not have meant that the sign itself, the Tor, 
was a Hebrew symbol, although they naturally inferred it, because the companions of that time did not know, as we do now, that the Hebrew Tor took the T form. The last letter of the alphabet, so far as they knew, had always looked like this. And it was only by the discovery of ancient inscriptions in comparatively recent times, particularly the Moabite stone, the oldest Hebrew inscription, that it could be positively affirmed that in the days of Ezekiel and of Solomon, the Tor took the form of a cross, thus, and thus, usually the first. Nor must we think that the mystic idea conveyed by this sign of acquittal or deliverance from an impending calamity was an invention of Royal Arch Companions. For an English author, Tyndale, writing in the beginning of the 15th century, mentions the sign Thor that defendeth us from the smiting and power of evil angels. In Egypt, they had the Ankh, or Crooks and Sata, which took practically the same form as the Hebrew Tor, and this was regarded as a mark of life. Our ancient brethren seem to have known both symbols, and to have regarded the two, the Tor and the Ankh, as having nearly similar import. This matter is worthy of study, because we think that the Tor is what led the old builder masons to adopt the level as a symbol of their craft lodges. They found that by inverting the level, they obtained a Tor. It was thus that they came to adopt the level as the sign of an installed master. They would naturally notice that it contained two right angles or squares. In ancient times, they also spoke of the Tor as a Hiram, and therefore this symbol, which some Masons used to say meant Templum Irosilimia, which might with propriety have been interpreted as meaning the Triple Hiram. If the object of the Companions in using such expressions was to conceal or disguise the illusion, either interpretation would have been equally suitable. In a previous publication, the writer has endeavoured to show how the books of Euclid lie behind the ceremonies of craft masonry, and the Kabbalists also made use of Euclid, transfiguring the symbols of geometry, using them as the medium of moral and spiritual lessons, and so making geometry illustrative of their speculative science. A Kabbalist teacher, Isaac bin Abraham bin Latif, sought to explain the right way to the sanctuary, that is, to the symbolic sanctum sanctorum. In this he made use of geometrical forms, which he said represented the self-revelation of God in the world of spirits. But we cannot conceive that he was the first to do this, or that the geometrical method was exclusively his. Dr. Ginsberg informs us that the Kabbalists used points and lines in their mystical diagrams as much as they employed the numerals and letters of their alphabet. Indeed, we know that Abraham bin Samuel Abulafia was already expanding secrets by means of gematria, which means taking the value of letters as so many numerals. The word gematria is a rabbinical corruption of geometry, and this suggests that from ancient times, the geometrical forms, as well as the numerals, were used as a means of expanding theological truth. Nowadays, we've all become familiar with Euclid from a very early age, for his books are in the hands of every pupil of a secondary school. But this was not always so. In the Middle Ages, Euclid was only known to a favoured few, and then he could only be studied in Arabic, Greek or Latin. How did Euclid come to England? It was early in the 12th century, between 1130 and 1140. Adelard, or rather Athelhard, an Ori Orientalist of Bath, who had travelled far and wide, went to Spain and there obtained a copy of his work in Arabic as a rare treasure. He brought it to England and translated it into Latin. The first printed edition appeared in 1472. 
And as Adelaide was a Christian and an Orientalist, he would naturally meet with other Christians with a liking for Oriental things, who had acquired a knowledge of Oriental languages. Let us remember that at this time, the Moors were dominant in Spain, and they and the Jews were the most learned people in the world. Of Adelard, we know that he composed an allegory, where two deities dispute among them. Philocosmia, who is followed by the five foolish satisfactions of fortune, power, dignity, fame and pleasure. And Philosophia, who is attended by the seven liberal arts and sciences. From this, we must suppose that the speculative science of the Spanish Kabbalists would have appealed to him. Although Adelaide was a Christian, he would have had no difficulty in entering into relations with the Kabbalists of Spain, for they were by no means exclusive or orthodox Jews. Indeed, they taught doctrines which were calculated to bring Jews and Christians and Mohammedans together. And we know that in the 13th century, they imparted their science to such Christians as had a liking for Hebrew studies. Although in such cases, the Kabbalistic system had to be much simplified to make it palatable or understandable to the Christian mind. It cannot be mere coincidence that soon after the importation of Euclid into England, we hear about Freemasonry in this country, and then we find it positively stated that Freemasonry is geometry, the fifth of the liberal arts and sciences. Thereafter, those people in England who found geometry an attractive or helpful subject, the architects, the antiquarians, the members of philosophical bodies, and other professional men were drawn to the new speculative science, and in that way were considered eligible for the diluted form of Kabbalism which was evolved in this country, and which soon became known by the name of Freemasonry. Accordingly, all the early Masonic documents now extant are unanimous in proclaiming geometry as the foundation and essence of speculative Freemasonry. The Matthew Cook manuscript says, Among all ye crafts of ye world of mans, craft masonry hath the most notability and most part of his science of geometry. And again, concerning the secrecy to which every adept was then bound, that he can heal the counsel of his fellows in lodge and in chambers and in every place there as Mason's heth. The Regis manuscript of about 1350 begins with these words, Hic incipiunt constitutiones artis gematriae secundum euclidem. In some respects, the secrecy of the early Masons was more stringent than that enjoined by the Kabbalists, for their geometry was something that could not be divulged, whereas with the Kabbalists, the science of geometry was merely an auxiliary, a convenient means of illustrating their ideas. The wonderful geometrical harmonies of the Triple Tour fully justify the importance which the Royal Archmasons have always attached to it. Of old time, it has been considered the emblem of emblems, but its significance comes from the fact that it illustrates the mystery of the three in one, for we definitely state that it corresponds to the grand triune deity. This correspondence of the triple tour to the greater triangle is demonstrated geometrically by dividing the latter into four other triangles. When we obtain eight right angles, which equals the number of the same number of right angles in the triple tour. We are told that of old, the name of God used to be enclosed in triangular forms. Who cannot see here allusion to the sacred symbol of the fellow craft with certain Hebrew characters inserted therein? In the midst of all our lights too, we find something which is highly esteemed, very precious, and full of meaning. A block of white marble, an altar of incense, a double cube. And with it there goes that great 
awful, tremendous, and incomprehensible name of the Most High, a name which has in itself the proof of the truism that he is what he was, was what he is, and ever shall remain both what he was and what he is from everlasting to everlasting. In the jewel worn by the companions, the combination of two triangles produces a hexagon, and in the center of that figure there is a third triangle, an equilateral one. Formerly, behind this small triangle was depicted a radiant sun, which corresponded to the blazing star of the craft mason. The Gnostics and other mystics of the ancient East used the initials of the divine name the Hebrew Yod, to form a mystical triangle. That is, they repeated that letter ten times and arranged the Yods in pyramidal form, the whole being enclosed in a circle. This mystic symbol was attributed to Pythagoras, as most of the ancient symbols were. We may note that there were four Yods on each side of the three sides, suggesting the various degrees the Entered Apprentice, Fellow Craft, Master Mason, and Royal Arch. While there is a fifth yod in the center, the number of the craftsman who advances to the east by five steps. The total of the ten yods here represents the Holy Tetractus of Pythagoras, that is, the potential decade. Thus, one plus two plus three plus four equals ten. We claim that the use of the triangle as a symbol of divinity can be traced to the days of Brother Pythagoras. In Egypt, there was also the sacred delta formed by the river Nile, which nourished the whole country and seemed to be a gift of the gods. The delta was, of course, a triangle. Thrice greatest Hermes, writing in the third century, tells us that Pythagoras had embellished both numbers and geometrical figures with appellations of the gods. Thus, for example, they referred to the equilateral triangle as the Athena triangle, and the three sides were named. Apollo, from privation of multitude and owing to the singleness of the monad, and two, strife and daring, and three, justice. For, as wrongdoing and being wronged were according to deficiency or excess, so justice was born of equality between them. Here we may note a similarity between the quaint statement of Hermes and the ideas suggested by the three pillars. For Apollo, being the founder of the arts, suggests wisdom. Strife and daring signify strength, and justice or righteousness is what we mean by benignity or beauty of character. The same Hermes has an interesting reference to the Pythagorean triangle, a right angled triangle to the containing sides of which the values of 3 and 4 were given. The resulting hypotenuse was bound to be 5, as we discover in the past master's jewel, that is, the 47th proposition of Euclid. He connects this, therefore, with the mysterious 60s of Clonbrotus, concerning which he has some doubts and hazards the conjecture, it may, may however, be connected, be connected with Babylonian, Babylonian ideas. ideas. The, the three, three may have been regarded, regarded as falling, falling into four, four so, so making twelve, 12. and this, this, in its, in its turn, turn, may have been regarded, regarded as falling into five, five. And, and so, so making, making sixty. sixty. In Babylon, three ruled heaven and earth and sea. Twelve stood for the signs of the zodiac, by which they regulated time. And sixty, owing to the prevailing system of numeration, indicated plenitude. The Babylonians counted by sixties. Hermes informs us that the books of the Chaldeans, that is, the literary works of Babylon, have been collected in the Alexandrian library, and that they were translated into Greek. Here then, was a golden bridge by which the ideas of ancient Babylon could have passed into the West, where the Kabbalists may have kept them alive. 
What a pity that all those works perished when the library was destroyed by fire. With us, the equilateral triangle is still viewed as a symbol of the triune essence of the deity. The representations of the Eternal Father by Roman Catholics often exhibits a radiant triangle at the crown of the head. As the said triangle is formed by three equal lengths put together, so we join the three divine titles in one word. While the number three is the root and foundation of everything, five, the number of the craftsmen, is also conspicuous in Royal Arch Masonry. For there are five signs which are said to correspond or to be parallel to the five points of a master mason. But here, as compared with the craft, there is a notable difference, for the five points indicate the manner in which we are expected to discharge our fraternal obligations, whereas the five signs of the Royal Arch teach us how we are to act in view of the relation we bear with the Almighty. Their meaning may be summed up thus, the first signifies our doom, the second resignation, the third supplication, the fourth suffering, and the last faith and hope. Again, the number five comes into prominence with the explanation of the geometrical symbols. For the device on the jewel worn by the companions forms by its intersections a given number of angles, and Taking these intersections in the five different ways possible, the sum of right angles in the several combinations respectively will be found to equal the five regular platonic bodies. These platonic bodies are declared to be emblems of the four elements and the sphere of the universe. The number of elements has not always been held to be four. At one time, they were said to be three, at another, five. Plato himself took these figures to represent the following elements. The tetrahedron or pyramid represented fire. The hexahedron or cube, earth. The octahedron, air. The dodecahedron, ether. And the icosahedron, water. According to him, the soul of nature combines the ideal with inert matter and produces the phenomenal world in which we live. In the Royal Arch, we learn that our greater triangle may be geometrically divided into four smaller triangles, three pointing up and one pointing down. The center of this latter triangle being also the center of the greater one. Both the greater triangle and the circle surrounding it are concentric figures and represent a connected whole. The first of the regular platonic bodies, the tetrahedron, is a solid figure containing four triangles, all equal and equilateral. But the four triangles, or four elements, suggest the holy tetractus of Brother Pythagoras, which is the symbol of the decade. For one plus two plus three plus four added together make ten, as already said. But what can be the meaning of this ten which is evolved out of four? The Kabbalists found the answer ready at hand, for they were using the Hebrew system of numeration, and in that system the number ten was expressed by the Yeti Yod, which was the initial of the name of the divinity. That Yod was put in the center of the sphere of the universe because they felt that this was the place corresponding to the Most High. The Royal Arch is unquestionably derived from a Hebrew source, and therefore most of the difficulties we meet with can be solved by reference to the Hebrew speech, numerals or script. The oldest Kabbalist book, the Sefer Yetzirah, is certainly founded on the Pythagorean notion of the creative power of numerals and letters, as well as speech. That number, 10, can also be obtained in another way. In the jewel worn by the companions, 
beside the symbol variously referred to as the three triangles or the triple triangle, etc., there are six smaller triangles at the extremities. In all, nine triangles. And these, added to the radiant sun which we imagine in the center, or the triple tor by which we substitute it, gives us 10 as the total. Again, in the chapter, our illumination is viewed as consisting of six lights, and these are added to the three words which the greater triangle typifies to give us a total of nine. While if we take into consideration the other symbol in the middle of the lights, the result will be the same as before, 10. Counting the steps taken by the principles in going from west to east, we find the total of 10. For when they say the words at the first, they move three and afterwards seven. Three plus seven equals 10. The explanation of the jewel, which forms an appendix to the ritual, shows the connection of the triple tor with the triple triangle, and it helps us realize that the former is an essential factor in the geometry of the royal arch, and not merely two letters, a T and H fortuitously thrown together. It is a geometrical clavis ad thesaurum. For more Masonic podcasts, videos, music, texts and artwork, visit fromthequarries.com or subscribe to our YouTube, Twitter and Facebook accounts by searching From the Quarries. Thank you.